black women are 80% more likely to change their hair from its natural state to something else that is more fitting for an office environment than other women. Bringing it up to modern times, we are in an age and decade where there are more campaigns, more understanding and information on the subject of black hair, specifically natural hair, and I do believe that there is a tie that has changed, that has incorporated a, an acceptance of natural hair in any environment you go into. This video was inspired by a poll that I saw on one of my favorite YouTube channels, Find Natural Hair Rocks, and she had done a poll about if anyone has ever faced discrimination based off of their natural hair. I was surprised to see that majority of women said no, and of course there are some that said yes. Personally, I have never faced discrimination or a particular behavior or microaggressions due to my natural hair. It actually has been quite the opposite. I remember one summer, I decided to wear my natural hair out to this job. Now, I had gone three years, no one had ever seen my natural hair. And it was a big step for me, but I felt like I needed to do it. And so when I did, surprisingly enough, so many of the children said that my hair was magical. I got tons of compliments from my coworkers, parents, my bosses, and I would consider this a paraprofessional environment because there was this sense of professionalism that we needed to display when we're working with our clients because we call them our clients. Now, I will say that historically, even in the black community, we had created a norm and that norm was relaxed hair, straight hair. Whether you want to say we were conforming to European standards or not, this was something that our community did not challenge, did not question, and did not appear to, to be stumped or hindered because of it. Now for me though, and this is the spin I want to contribute to this discussion, is my faith. I don't ascribe to a victim mentality. I think most people will take the microaggressions, the discrimination, the racism, whatever labels you want to attach to the unfair treatment of someone based off of their physical appearance, they'll internalize that and then become a victim to it. And so rather than sporting my natural hair as just because that is the way it is, that is the art that God has birthed from my scalp, that is the conception of my creator, I'm releasing it in a form of rebellion and anger and resentment. And that doesn't really provide room for growth, personal development and overcoming. And I know a big part of how I've overcome the attachment to my hair as a form of identity, but also the opinions of people was through my faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I personally have taken on the reality that God is the head of my life and that all the injustices done to me because of the way I look or because I'm a woman or because I'm black or because of whatever it is that people tend to do, it all falls on him and he's the one that's going to make, make it right because he says vengeance is mine. And so he tells us to love our enemies. He tells us to not hold records of wrong. And he tells us that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, because if we stay victim to this world and its standards, we'll never grow, we'll never reach those heights of faith and miracles that God wants to perform in our lives. It is absolutely important that you recognize and discern what is best, not only for yourself, but for others involved. I think of the story of Esther. It's my favorite story in the Bible because you see how God works behind the scenes when injustices are being done to his people. So Esther hears from Mordecai that there is a man, a villain in the story named Haman who has plotted to massacre the entire Jewish people from the Persian Empire. And so when Esther catches wind of this, she fasts, she prays. She uses discernment to orchestrate a banquet for the king because her motivation and her desire is to reach him to stop this plan from being actualized. The rule in this kingdom was for a queen not to show up without the king summoning her. Otherwise, she could be punished by death. Well, Esther, or Hadassah, Esther puts on her best royal robes. She puts on a perfect banquet 
And then with boldness surrounding her and God's favor, she walks right up to the king without being summoned. And because he loved her and God put so much favor in the king's heart for Esther, she was accepted. And eventually at the end of that story, she prevailed along with Mordecai and so on. And both were elevated to positions of power and influence. What am I trying to get at? In this world, whether you're in a corporate environment, whether you are an entrepreneur, whether you are an athlete, you know, whatever, an actor, so on and so forth, there are policies that are unchanged, there are rules, there are standards. And regardless of how good or bad they are, that is the reality of this world that we live in. So for the benefit of yourself and the benefit of the people around you, using discernment to know what you need to do to get that promotion or what you need to do to elevate in your career, what you need to do to book and sign more clients, there's nothing wrong with using wisdom to say that if I put on this presentation, this will give me this result. I think sometimes as black women, we feel that everyone has to accept us. Everyone has to agree with the way that we are who we are. And that's an unrealistic expectation to ask of the world. We live in a fallen condition. Everyone around you has biases. Everyone around you discriminates. Everyone around you may not like you. You are perhaps the villain in somebody's story. And not everyone's gonna treat you right. We can't blanket statement and take that blanket statement and live from that place because we're going to miss out on so many blessings. We're going to miss out on all the things that God wants to walk us into because we're holding on to our victim. We're holding on to, well, if I can't wear my natural hair out, then I'm not going to X, Y, and Z. Do you really want to sabotage or do you really want to hold yourself back because you want the world to accept you as you are when that is the most unrealistic thing to ask of anyone? You know, I remember when I was in college and the news station was there because there was this big uproar about affirmative action and i remember i was with another african-american guy he actually was african i'm black he's african and we got stopped by one of the anchors and they wanted to interview us they wanted our opinions about affirmative action i forgot what he said but i remember what i said to them and this is a long time ago i said you know if i'm meant to be somewhere then i will be I don't believe that anyone can hold me back unless God closes the door. And that's what I said. And I remember when we walked up, he was like, you're going to catch a lot of fire from, from black folks because of what you just said. And I was just like, well, so be it. But that's my conviction. That's where I stand. Nothing holds me back in this life unless God closes that door. And there's a scripture in Revelation, I believe it's three verse eight. And he's, and Jesus is speaking obviously to a church who had done good works. And he says, behold, the doors, oh, I lay the door open for you that no man can shut. And I feel that as long as I'm serving serving God and walking in obedience to him and accepting his view of me, they can put as many walls as they want. They could put as many hurdles in front of me. They can hold me back 50 meters behind while everyone else gets a head start. Let them because it'll only take a move of God to catapult me far ahead of everyone. I, I just want to see black women be free of the chains of society and trying to measure up to what the black community is saying. Well, you should be able to rock your natural hair and blah, blah, blah. You don't be wearing wigs and weaves and all this stuff. You rock your natural. Like, so you have that community, you have that mentality, that group think mentality that no one seems to challenge, but they're yet so aggressive about it towards women who decide that they don't want to do that. But then I do agree that the opposite end should not be to hide who you are for anyone. So that's my little encouragement. That was a very long introduction, but I wanna get into these 10 questions that I think are unspoken. I think maybe people might be afraid to ask because they don't want to be seen as a self-hating black woman. I think it's absolutely asinine and crazy that a woman cannot change up her looks without being labeled um, a person that hates herself. Granted, there are some that do. I definitely am a recovering person from that where I hated my hair the way I looked for such a long time. I wouldn't dare leave my home without wig, makeup, and so on. Now, I can. <laughs> 
Let's start with the first question. How do I maintain my natural hair in a professional setting where I'm the minority? You maintain it how you would normally take care of your hair, no matter where you are. And you are not the minority. You are the majority when God is on your side. So really with him, you can do all things. <laughs> and that's what the word says. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So maintain your hair, keep it well kept. I just don't think that I want to roll out of bed and just go to work like that. That's I just don't understand why someone would think that's empowering. I'm not rolling out of bed just as much as I wouldn't roll out of bed and not brush my teeth and shower and make sure I have proper clothes on. I'm going to maintain my hair as well. So there's that. The second question, what are effective ways to respond to inappropriateness or microaggressions in the workplace regarding my natural hair? Again, I believe love is the answer for everything and love not accepting what people do to you and just letting them walk over you. But love also overlooks those wrongs at times, especially when you consider the cost. Is it worth it for you to get into an argument with someone because of a microaggression that you're not even sure if it is or not? Part of the problem with us when we're holding on to victimhood is we look at everyone as being an enemy and we see everything they do as a microaggression. We see everything they do as an insult. And this is a person that is full of themselves. You're full of pride or you're full of your ego. That's why you're easily offended. That's why you're easily insulted because you're you're so full of yourself that you are going to see everything as an offense to you. And so stop looking for the microaggressions. And if it is obvious and maybe you felt like that was something that should not have happened, you go to that person in quiet and privacy and talk to them. Let them know how it made you feel. And if there's no changes after that, like our Lord said, you have to leave it to God. Vengeance belongs to him and he can get someone back better than you can. So keep your job. Don't get belligerent. Don't get dramatic about it because everybody has microaggressions. Everyone has discrimination biases. That's why the human race is in the condition it's in now. But don't look for it, you know, and if again, if it comes up, just handle it with grace, handle it with class and ensure that you talk to the person and make sure that it wasn't microaggression or maybe it was a misunderstanding. Maybe because they're not used to working with a black woman with natural hair, maybe they didn't understand. If you feel that someone is calculated in how they treat you and you know for sure and you have evidence that it is due to the way you look, then there are always higher people to go to your human resource. Don't even talk to the person directly. That's if you have the evidence. So that's where I stand on that question. All right. Number three, should I feel compelled to change my natural hair to fit into professional standards? No, you shouldn't feel forced. If you feel forced and now you're just trying to people please. So you shouldn't feel forced. If you feel forced, that's, that's an internal issue perhaps. And maybe really pick the brains of the people around you. If you feel comfortable enough, ask people what, how they feel about it. Sometimes I think if we just learn to open our mouths and talk and ask questions and try to understand other people's perspectives, it will save us a lot of trouble. Number four, are there professional hairstyles that I can achieve using my natural hair? Absolutely. In fact, there's a YouTuber, I'm gonna link her below, but she has so many cute updos. She has so many cute hairstyles for just elegance, you know? And I think, again, I'm not rolling out of bed with my hair matted up and going to work that way. Just like I wouldn't go out, go to work with a body con, body wrap, bandage dress when I'm working in an office. If you just Google elegant updos for natural hair, you'll find a plethora of styles to try that are professional. Number five, what is the impression my natural hair may leave on clients and how can I manage it effectively? I mean, it can leave a lot of impressions. I had a season of my business where I was wearing my natural hair on my calls with my clients. <laughs> I would show up to photo shoots because I'm a photographer. I would show up with my natural hair. People don't remember that. They remember how you treat them. They remember how you helped them and served them. And they may remember, oh, the girl with the Afro. They may say things like that, but the impression most people will have of you is not so much the way you look, unless it's very extreme and you have the Afro the size of the moon. <laughs> but for the most part, they're gonna remember how you treated them. That goes a long way because even as someone who costly changes my hair for my business, 
most of my clients could care less. They they love more the expertise and the help that I give them uh, with their businesses. So yes, okay. Number six, how do I deal with the possible stigma associated with natural hair in the workplace? You don't deal with it. It's not your fight. It is someone else's fight. Learn to be free from people. Learn to get free from, I mean, and there are, I may have to do another video on that. If you guys want to know how to get free from people, let me know and I'll, I'll do a video on that. But just get free from the world, get free from, from it because it doesn't matter. You're going to walk in an environment where they love your natural hair and then you're gonna walk into an environment where they hate your natural hair. You're gonna walk in an environment where there is no stigma and you're gonna walk in where there is stigma. You can't live your life trying to please either. Number seven, can my natural hairstyles affect my chances of getting a job or being promoted? Maybe. If you walk in with that fear, then that fear will come to pass because there's a scripture that says, a uh, Job actually said this, that the thing I feared came upon me. I have experienced this myself where I feared a loss of a relationship and I lost that relationship eventually. So if you walk in with the fear that someone's gonna discriminate you from getting the job or you're going to not be promoted or whatever the case is, that is exactly what's going to happen so get rid of that fear stop being concerned what how someone else can control your destiny um god is in control of your destiny and if he wants you to get that promotion you're going to get it regardless of what bias the, the the boss may hate your guts and they may be jealous of you and they may be trying to sabotage you but the holy spirit is going to be three steps ahead of them and five steps ahead of the ceo and three steps ahead of the president and he's going to ensure that what he wants for you comes to pass so if you don't get the promotion don't blame them just say that this is what god wanted this is how he he closed the door that's it Okay, number eight, what are my rights as an employee who chooses to keep natural hair? Your rights as any employee that should and ought to be treated fairly it will vary from corporation to corporation. So make sure you know the policies of your corporation or your company that you work at. And also some federal and state laws that may have something to do with that as well. But again, be sure if you're gonna bring a suit against someone, you have efficient and sufficient evidence and nothing that is hearsay or just perceptional. Number nine, how frequently can I change my natural hairstyles at work without raising eyebrows? So when I was working as a head instructor and interim center director at this tutoring center, I changed my hair all the time. And what happened sometimes that I would come in with a wig maybe to my back and maybe the next time I would have a bob and the next time I would have a twist out and so on. And I just remember everyone was fine with it. Kids will point it out because their kids are very outspoken and they're trying to understand the world and so they, they don't know anything about filters. And so I had to learn to develop tough skin around kids and they thought my hair was magical and people always complimented me. And maybe there were some thoughts about, well, why does she change her hair up so much? But that it really wasn't a big deal because honestly, if I spend too much time thinking about how someone feels about what I'm choosing to do with my hair, I am totally robbing myself of freedom and I'm giving a lot of power to that individual, way more than they should have. The only person that I'm concerned with is the Lord and that, that's basically it. The final question, are there ways to quantify potential bias discrimination against natural hair in professional spaces? Well, there are factors such as subjective perceptions societal attitudes that have been embedded and personal bias that makes this a complex issue to quantify accurately. But there are research efforts to provide some empirical and quantifiable insight into the nature and extent of the discrimination against natural hair and professional spaces, but consult your lawyer if it really gets to that level. They'll know what to do. Maybe there is and maybe there isn't. I remember when I walked into an American apparel store not too far from campus, I felt watched and I would be followed when I was in this store. Someone that worked at that store confessed this to me because we ended up being in the same class and it was an intercultural communication class and it was a very, very emotionally charged class. And I remember she had confessed to the class that, you know, they are trained on spotting out the most typical shoplifters and most of the time they are black or african-american teens 
and to keep an eye on them. So there was a time where that happened to me and I did, for lack of a better word, raised hell about it because I knew that I was being followed and accused of potentially stealing an item. And it didn't profit me anything because it's not like they changed, but I will say that that store ended up being closed after some a couple years had gone by. Would I say that that was God's act of vengeance for me? I'm gonna claim that it was, but people do not get away with mistreating you. Most theft in my neighborhood happens from other black people. Um, so there is, that's wise, because if you know that there's a certain group that does a certain thing, then it would only be wise for you to be more cognizant of when that group is present. Now granted, you shouldn't make it obvious and there should be a way to go about it where you're not profiling every black person that walks into that beauty supply store. So I don't know if there is a way to quantify potential bias. There's always a gamble that you're just overlooking it and stuff like that doesn't hold up in court. It doesn't hold up in lawsuits. And so again, you either have to look very, very hard, get a confession out of someone, but I just find that that is an exercise in futility. And it's so much better to just live your life free from people and the world standards and biases and discriminations. And God knows because only he knows the heart of man and only he can exact vengeance in a way that will bring justice on both sides. So the person that he's exacting vengeance on is to bring them to his forgiveness, but then also for you so that you don't have to hold that pressure and that accuracy of knowing for sure if someone is discriminating against you. I know not everyone ascribes to the Christian faith and I hope that through the video you have felt an invitation to try because it's too much on a human being to walk through this life with all the different hindrances that comes because our enemy is also someone who is not physical but he is a spirit he is a fallen angel and he has a sophisticated enemy camp he's going to devour whoever he might and without the power and help of God on your side, you'll just be a victim to you, to your circumstances always. Now, if you have suffered or have experienced any of these things that we talked about, it is not to minimize your struggle or to minimize your experiences. I'm sure there are some watching that may have resentment or anger or bitterness or just a lot, you know, it's it's unfair really that we have to even deal with these things, but it's the reality of living in a fallen world in need of a savior. Uh, we all need saving. One person's sin is not greater than the others. Um, before God, all sin is the same. And, and forgiveness is the route to freedom. Uh, forgiveness is not just for us, but for us to release to others who have done us wrong so that we don't miss out on the forgiveness that God brings us because Jesus said, if we don't forgive others, then God won't forgive us. There's just no room for that in the life of Jesus because this is a life full of perfect love and perfect love casts out all fear. And the more that I have witness the love of God in my life the freer I have felt and I feel like there's more levels of freedom we know when you get when you get saved there is a peace already but then as you keep living in that perfect love through faith in Christ and what he has done for you at Calvary your life starts to feel limitless you start to feel as if miracles are happening around you all the time and even with folks that treat you wrong or treat you bad there's a grace that's released to them from you from god through you and it just opens the world the world doesn't have a solution for this you guys the, the world doesn't have a solution to fix people's hearts and so to try and fight people's hearts or fight people on their surface knowing that it's really the heart that really needs changing it's a uh, exercise in vain and until Jesus gets a hold of all the people that are doing you wrong, that are racist towards you or sexist or whatever isms are out there, until Jesus gets a hold of them, they will continue to be the way they are. So why should you continue being a slave to that when you could be free? You guys have a wonderful and blessed day. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye.